really excited to talk about some steel, steel engineering and, and specifically additive manufacturing and diving into how to use steels, why to use steels in additive and, and really trying to pull out what are the what are the applications that we can see today? Where can we go from there? Um, but before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of different items. Um, so uh, I, I've, we've muted the attendees list. Um, certainly we can use the chat function. If there are questions as they come up, we'll be answering some questions at the end as well. Um, but we'll start with kind of a conversation. We'll start with um, presentations from uh, both Dr. Midson um, and and uh, uh, Daniel from Bowler as well. Um, and I'll introduce them and, and talk a little bit about um, who they are. Um, but I, I wanted to start with kind of a conversation or a discussion about um, additive manufacturing, why to use additive manufacturing and the business cases that we've seen. Um, so I will jump into that um, here momentarily. So, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, uh, depends on what you like to call it, particularly um, in steels and in the metals industry. I found three, the best business cases are generally focused on creating internal cooling channels that are impossible to create any other way, combining components so you can take many components and condense them into a single component, and lightweighting. Lightweighting seems to be typically the, the uh, side benefit. Typically, you're not 3D printing to get the lightweighting alone. You have to have several different reasons on why you're going at it. And in particular, in steels, there are some lightweighting applications and some reasons that you'd go after that. Um, but primarily, you have to have the other pieces of it as well to make a really good business case. Now, the presenters today are going to be focusing in on, on steels in dyes and for dye materials, whether that's dye inserts um, for dye casting or, or other sorts of uh, tooling applications. But I want to I want to keep everyone's mind open to these same principles can apply to other applications in additive manufacturing, whether that's in aerospace, uh, whether that's in oil and gas mining. There are a lot of different ways that I think we can use what has been learned in the in the cooling and the dye industry that can be applied to a lot of other industries. So while we're going to hear a lot about the steels and, and the business cases behind, um, you know, conformal cooling channels, that sort of thing, there's a lot, I think, to be gained um, in the concepts of you don't have to have straight channels that run uh, in, in only one direction or complex methods of, of, you know, changing the direction of those channels and then having to braze or weld the one end of the, the hole that you had to drill to make the, to make the turn. Um, so I want to, I want everyone to focus on uh, the, I think, excellent and interesting cases that have been made for additive manufacturing in the dye industry and think about how that might apply to your industry because all of you who have signed up uh, are experts in your own fields. Um, and so I want us to have kind of that discussion and, and that's some of the point and, and I'll talk a little bit more about the contest that we'll have um, at the end of the the uh, webinar today so that we can kind of discuss, well, how do we take this not just from a conversation today where we give you some information and it's interesting, um, but to that next level of how do we generate a, a, a use case that all of us can take to our bosses, our um, customers, uh, the, the DOD, NASA, anyone who we are trying to bring a product to and say, here is an example of how it worked over here, and this is why it can work in this application. So that's the point of today's webinar. I would really like everyone to um, make sure that they're uh, taking away as much from this conversation as they can and thinking about how do they apply that in their industry, not just so that we can uh, you know, create a bigger industry for additive manufacturing, but really so that we can find some applications and some use cases that we can talk about that aren't 10 years old. Um, in additive and and there's been excellent applications that we haven't been able to talk about in the last 10 years because everyone has kind of pulled that in and they're doing their own thing. So I want to open the conversation up at the end of the, the discussion today. But um, to begin here, I would like to introduce uh, Steve Midson. So 
I've known Steve now for about a decade. We met at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, he is now a, a research professor there, um, and he has been running the ADAPT Center. Um, the ADAPT Center is really focused on additive manufacturing, but uh, in Steve's case, his background has been in die casting and industry, um, in looking at making materials and forming materials um, through many different methods. And so um, I guess without further delay, uh, here is Dr. Mitzen. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me show my screen. So hopefully you can see my screen and hear me. So uh, I'm going to be talking about additive manufacturing of steels for die casting applications. And so the presentation summary, uh, uh, before I get into actually talking about uh, uh, applications, I'm going to introduce the ADAPT Center as uh, as um, Jacob said, I am one of, actually one of four board members who help run the ADAPT Center at the Colorado School of Mines. So this is an industry uh, academic consortium focused on additive manufacturing. Then I'm going to go on to talk about the status of using additive manufacturing for the production of die insert for the high pressure die casting process. And then I'm going to move a little bit away from die casting, continuing talking about steels, but describe the use of binder jetting for the production of steel components. So first, let me talk about ADAPT, which is the Alliance for the Development of Additive Processing Technologies, which, as I said, is uh, based at the Colorado School of Mines. And it's an industry academic consortium and a research center focusing on develop, developing additive manufacturing technologies. And so we utilize the skills set that we have at the Colorado School of Mines, which is really focused on advanced materials characterization, and artificial intelligence technologies to optimize for additive manufacturing. And we're involved in process materials and parts. And so uh, um, the center was formed about four or five years ago uh, from a grant from the uh, state of Colorado. And uh, um, these were our founding members and they helped provide some of the cost share that started the center. And then um, since then we have added the members shown on the right hand side involved in various aspects of additive from material production from a, 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 a parts producer end user uh, uh, and machine manufacturers so um, we are very involved in interdisciplinary research uh, we have uh, eight to 12 active faculty members across the department uh, i'm involved in metallurgical materials engineering the one shown here at the top um, and then uh, um, we also have people from mechanical engineering, from physics, from electrical engineering, from computer science. Uh, the funding we have, it kind of depends upon exactly when you're looking at it, but kind of as an average, somewhere between two to four million dollars uh, per year, and that's supporting 12 to 18 students supported annually. And so one of the things that we did recently was that we developed what we are calling a research roadmap for ADAPT. Uh, and this was developed during a two-day meeting back in uh, uh, March 2021. Uh, and our objective was not to focus on the entire additive manufacturing industry, the entire manu additive manufacturing arena, but specifically designed to identify research ideas that fit within the strategic strengths of uh, the ADAPT Center. And then as we look forward, uh, we are now looking to try to develop action items for the various items. And we're going to have a meeting on August 25th, 26th, and that we will be kind of focusing on those ideas to uh, try and develop the action items. And we, uh, during our road mapping session, uh, we identified a whole number of different research ideas that should be addressed. And they we divided them into the nine functional areas shown here, which are uh, uh, applications for additive, uh, talking about the actual processes themselves, uh, obviously new alloys and materials, uh, always of interest. And then we get into the actual bills, so parameter identification and what parameters should be examined and process control related to those parameters. Then we get into post-processing, inspection, testing, and quality assurance. Um, then we're looking at standardization of processes across different platforms and things like that. What can we standardize? Workforce development is obviously a big thing at the Colorado School of Mines. We're obviously into teaching and training. 
And so workforce development, we think, is something that we can really address. And then the last one, the, the ninth one, is kind of something that didn't fit anywhere else. So we're calling it cost reduction strategies for powder-based processes. And so we're hoping to kind of build on this and build our research agenda based on that at the Colorado School of Mines. So that was just a brief introduction. So now let me talk about uh, additive manufacturing applications for the high pressure die casting process and specifically for die inserts that we use in our dies. So before I get into the details, let me just define uh, the high pressure die casting process. And so we use a hydraulically activated electronically controlled plunger that injects the liquid metal into reusable steel dies. And we use extremely high speeds, somewhere between uh, 1,000 to 2,000 inches per second gate speed. And so that's nearly up to like half a football field a second. And we use very, very fast cavity fill times, somewhere between like 20 milliseconds for small parts to maybe 200 milliseconds for a large part like an engine block or something like that. And then once the cavity is filled, we use extremely high pressures. Uh, 6,000 to uh, 15,000 PSI to squeeze the metal to feed more liquid into the cavity to uh, compensate for uh, solidification shrinkage and then to shrink down any entrapped gas so the pores, the gas pores, become shrink down, shrunk down and become very, very small. Then this is a, 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 a picture of a die. This is obviously a very, very simple die. This is actually a die that we just built for some uh, experimental trials that we were doing on a uh, die casting machine at the Ohio State University. So obviously dyes get much, much more complicated than this, but this is kind of a good example of what a die looks like. And so uh, traditionally, and this one in particular, the die inserts are machined from H13 tool steel. Uh, and then we uh, take forged steel blocks, we machine them and heat treat them to the final shape. And then these inserts, the cavity insert and the runner block inserts are uh, uh, then uh, um, uh, inserted into a larger holding block that's fabricated from steel, such as 4140. And so here's some examples of our die castings. And so uh, uh, the one on the top left um, is a uh, dashboard or a, a instrument panel for a car. And it, cr it goes a full span width of the car. And it's a single die casting produced from a magnesium alloy. The bottom left um, is a, a lift, the tailgate for a big SUV. And uh, it's obviously a very big die casting and it's probably uh, produced by high vacuum die casting from an aluminum alloy. Bottom right uh, is a transmission case uh, housing uh, for a car. This is again, is one of the bigger die castings that's produced and uh, would be produced a, a, in a conventional die casting machine uh, from an aluminum alloy. The top right picture I really like uh, because it really shows the uh, complexity and the typical shape of die casting. So most die castings, thin walls, we try to avoid thick areas because thick areas will be full of shrinkage porosity and gas entrapment. So instead of using large areas to produce strength, we use ribbing to produce strength and stiffness. And obviously, you can kind of see the complex nature of die castings. So when we're talking about additive manufacturing, so what are the benefits for die casting die inserts? So cost reduction is a potential. But I think as Jacob was talking about during his introduction, it's really conformal cooling that is driving additive manufacturing use in die casting dies. And so I think the picture on the right really highlights kind of what's going on here. On the left, we have a traditional machine insert. And as we are machining the cooling lines, obviously we have to drill them. And so they have to be straight. But cooling is extremely important in die casting. There's a lot of heat transferred from the solidifying casting. We need to keep the die at a reasonable temperature and we need to extract the heat so we can make the next casting. And so we kind of limited in terms of what we can do with traditional machining. But with conformal cooling, the one shown on the right, we have pretty much unlimited flexibility. When we're building it layer by layer, at least with the uh, powder bed fusion process, we can really determine where we want to put our conformal cooling lines. And that gives us a lot of commercial benefits in die casting. The first one is shorter cycle time. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through that. 
But the faster we can extract the heat, the faster we can eject the casting, the faster we can make our next casting, the more castings we can make per hour and the more revenue we can generate. So shorter cycle times is a real commercial benefit to us. Solder reduction also. Solder reduction is when the molten aluminum or the solidifying aluminum sticks to the steel die. And normally it occurs when the die gets very, very hot above about 500 degrees centigrade. And so it occurs in areas that are difficult to cool with traditional cooling plans. And so, but with conformal cooling, we can get cooling into these difficult to cool areas, reduce the die temperature, reduce soldering, and again, increase productivity. We're seeing that heat checking reduction is reduced. Heat checking is the normally the, the reason why a die will fail. It's kind of the little cracking that occurs on the surface of the die that after, when it gets too bad, we have to throw the insert away and produce a new one. And we're seeing that heat checking can be reduced through the use of conformal cooling. Another big one is porosity reduction. Uh, a lot of die castings are used in leak tank applications where you're processing fluid, and if that fluid leaks, then the casting is scrap and we have to throw it away. With conformal cooling, we are seeing porosity reduction in some of the critical areas, and therefore we no longer get leak reduction, or the number of castings that we get leak reduction in is significantly reduced. We are reducing scrap rates, again, increasing productivity and revenue. So all these conformal cooling is having a huge impact, a very large impact upon these items. Other reasons for using additive production of bi biometallic cores, I'll talk about that in a minute, and repair of die cavity inserts, I'll also talk about that. So here's a statistic from uh, the die casting engineer. This was published back in May 2020. And the die casting trade association, NADCA, uh, did a survey of their corporate members, and they asked them on the left, uh, have you heard about using additive manufacturing for die casting tools? And 80% said yes. Then on the right-hand side, they asked, are you interested in using additive manufacturing? And what's really interesting to me is the right-hand uh, peak, because 40% of the people who responded, I'm not sure we can extrapolate that to the whole industry, but of the respondents, 40% said they're already currently using additive. And I think the, the, the left-hand uh, uh, figure here, I think is also really interesting. While half or so only have one to three inserts in their plant, if you look at the two right-hand uh, columns, then 20% uh, um, have between eight and 15, and 10% have 15 or more. So that is 30% of the people who said yes, right? 40% said yes, so that's about 12% of the total respondents said they had eight or more inserts in their additive manufactured inserts in their die. That really surprised me. And then the right hand figure also really surprised me. The 80% said they're using H13 steel for these additive parts. And uh, uh, anyone familiar with the uh, powder bed fusion of H13 steel knows that's really difficult, uh, really difficult to avoid cracking. So that suggests that those are not produced by powder bed fusion. And then 40% uh, uh, said mar raging steel, which are probably powder bed fusion parts. So what are people using? So people are using what I'm calling a subtractive plus additive approach. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. They're using powder bed fusion. They are using directed energy deposition, but conformal cooling channels are difficult with the directed energy deposition process, but you can produce bimetallic inserts that way. Then how about binder jetting? Not currently used for die inserts, but auto companies are seeking to replace low volume aluminum parts, maybe specifically die castings with lighter weight steel binder jet components. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the subtractive and additive technology. This is used by a company called HTS. Uh, and what they do is uh, kind of shown in the uh, picture on the right, uh, where they machine the steel inserts in a traditional subtractive approach but then they use an additive approach to combine these inserts to produce the conformal cooling channels such as shown here, using either diffusion bonding or a directed energy deposition process. They're using this in plastic injection molding and also in die casting. And HDS claims about a 10% faster die casting cycle rate when using their conformal cooled shop block. So again, this goes back to faster cycles I talked about earlier. 
How about powder bed fusion? So I think Exco Engineering is a good example of what's going on with powder bed fusion. They are a major automotive die builder based in Ontario, Canada. And I, I talked to them recently and they say that they have four EOS powder bed fusion machines running basically 24 seven. They're processing somewhere around 10,000 pounds uh, per year of uh, additive uh, die components. Uh, primarily Mar Agent 300 because that works really well in the powder bed fusion process. But they tell me they're just starting to examine a Dido steel. Uh, Dido is a Japanese steel maker called HGC40, uh, which is much more similar to the H13 uh, composition. Their maximum size is 16 by 16, but they have produced larger inserts uh, by welding to, uh, different additive parts together to produce larger inserts. How about uh, uh, AM at Stellantis? Stellantis is the old Fiat Chrysler. They changed their name earlier this year. And this is some information that uh, Corey Vian provided to me from Stellantis. Uh, this is actually a couple of years out of date. It was a presentation from 2019. And he talked about a nine-speed transmission bell die that was produced with approximately 33% additive content. And that's kind of the picture shown at the top right there. And they were able to get a faster cycle. So the traditional die, cycle time was about 100 seconds with the additive die they were able to go down to 80 seconds why uh, this was an improvement due to uh, reduced spray time before we make a casting and die casting we spray a lubricant or a parting agent onto the die and they were able to uh, reduce that spray time by 50 percent because of the cooler temperature of the inserts and the cooler temperature of the inserts also reduce their dwell time um, they had told me verbally they have now recently installed a converter housing die where all the inserts were produced by additive. So here's a research project uh, being performed by uh, Carl Soderheim and uh, Darren Appellian. Uh, uh, this, uh, these guys uh, were at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. They recently moved to University of California, Irvine. And the project goal is to develop guidelines for people in the die casting industry for the use of additive inserts in terms of the cooling design exactly how close should the insert the cooling lines be to the uh, die surface how close they should be to each other what we found is that when we started using conformal cooling people put a lot of cooling in the insert and overcool the inserts and so now they're backing off we don't need as much as we can actually get in there and so Carl is trying to tell us exactly how much we should be using. And he's also doing some stress modeling to look at uh, 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 the uh, high levels of internal stress that have uh, caused some early failures on some additive parts. Then I talked about bimetallic cores. And so here's an example of a bimetallic core. So this is DMG Mori and Verstappelin. Uh, they won an award from NADCA. NADCA has a die casting competition every year. NADCA is the trade association. And they won for this uh, 3.5 pound uh, aluminum engine bracket shown on the top right. And uh, they utilized a core in this uh, fabricated from a bronze alloy with a steel outer shell produced by DED, also utilized in conformal cooling. So the picture on the bottom right kind of gives you an indication of what a can of core produced like this would look like. And with the copper in the middle and the steel on the outside, the copper gives you the higher thermal conductivity. The problem with a copper core is you can't use it in die casting because the aluminum will dissolve the core really quickly, dissolve a copper core really quickly. And so you have to put a protective steel shell on the core and you can do that with directed energy deposition. And there's some of the benefits that they uh, uh, reported in the die casting engine last year. So here's die repair. So uh, this is a paper by David Schwarm from Case Western Reserve University all the way back in 2014. And if you look at picture number one, this is a shop riser, the shop block uh, with some solder damage on it. So they, in picture number two, they machine the solder away. Picture number three, built it back up with directed energy deposition and pitch number four machined it back to uh, the final shape and the insert after repairing with my region 300 ran another 70 70 000 shots in a commercial die casting plant okay last couple of slides i want to talk about binder jetting not in 
for the use of dyes, but for the actual production of steel components themselves. So this is uh, uh, some information, again, I got from Stellantis. And uh, um, they looked at uh, uh, converting the part shown on the left, which is a, uh, a 6.1 pounds assembly of 24 parts from aluminum and steel weighing 6.1 pounds. And they looked at converting it to a binder jet steel part. And because of the design flexibility with binder jetting, you can uh, uh, reduce the weight significantly. So they got some functional improvements. They got some quality improvements. They got an overall space reduction, mass reduction, but they couldn't get the cost to work. So this is not yet a commercial application. Uh, Corey says that cost was close, but the cost of the additive part was still more than the assembly. And so this is not yet a commercial application, but Corey uh, tells me he really likes binder jetting for this application. But then uh, 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 at General Motors, uh, this is coming from the Detroit Bureau from an article from December 2020. Uh, a guy from General Motors was quoted as saying that they think AM is really suited to low volume manufacturing, where we're talking about hundreds of parts per year, maybe into the low thousands of parts per year, but certainly not the hundreds of thousands needed on a high volume project. And they talked about some examples, uh, some parts for a new Cadillac models, uh, which will each have four 3D printed parts and brackets and emblems. And then on the right hand side, uh, they gave the example for the Corvette. Uh, C8R model, where the printed version of the oil reservoir uses two printed parts rather than 16 welded parts. So again, applications are for steel additive manufacturing. So in summary, additive manufacturing is being used to produce uh, dyes for die casting dyes, primarily because of the conformal cooling that's available. Fabricated using several processes, this subtractive and additive process I talked about, powder bed fusion, directed energy deposition for bimetallic cores. Materials are currently H13 steel, mostly I think for the, this is my opinion, for the subtractive and additive approach. Maraging steel probably for powder bed fusion, and then bimetallic cores are available. Okay, so that is uh, my presentation. Uh, Jacob, back to you. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, take questions if we have time. Excellent. Um, I do have a couple of questions here that we've gotten in. Um, the first is, uh, have you seen any or heard of any advantages in lead time? And, and is there a typical lead time for, for dye inserts? I don't have good data on that. Um, what Exco is saying verbally, uh, and they said this quite a while ago, so I assume it's still current, is that when they get small dye inserts in, then they just go straight to uh, 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 additive manufacturing. So pretty much across the board, all their small inserts are produced that way. But Exco is producing huge dies, you know, big dies that are, you know, are bigger than your office desk. And, uh, you know, so there are different parts that go in that. So um, I have not specifically heard about, uh, uh, um, um, you know, a, a, a faster turnaround. Uh, but certainly, you know, when you go to get a part machine, you're talking weeks uh, uh, lead time. And so the potential is certainly there. Whether it's been utilized, I don't know. Uh, and then in addition, you had mentioned that there there was a case where uh, the conformal cooling was too efficient. Um, is there any thought of combining conformal cooling and conformal heating to uh, get back to temperatures before the next shot? Well, that's uh, we we don't. Uh, uh, so, so generally, what happens is the die within within aluminum die cast in plastic injection molding. Let me take a stop. In plastic injection molding, I think they can use cooling and heating because they are operating around 100 degrees centigrade or so, right? With aluminum die casting, the aluminum is injected about 600 degrees centigrade, 1100 degrees Fahrenheit or so, and so we have this huge amount of uh, 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 heating into the heat. Uh, enthalpy going into the die. And so generally in die casting, our problem is getting the die cool enough. And so we sometimes do use oil heating, but not necessarily for actually getting the die hot, but just so it doesn't drop down below a minimum temperature of you know, 200, 250 degrees centigrade. So our problem in general, th this is a new problem for us, you know, overcooling a die. This is not generally an issue in die casting. The issue is how to get the die cold enough. 
And so uh, we do not use heating, and I don't think we will ever use heating. I think all we have to do is kind of really get a better idea of what the optimum uh, conformal cooling configurations are. And that's kind of what Carl's project is. It's a five-year project funded by the Department of Defense. He's in about three and a half years into it. And so, uh, you know, we're expecting a lot of good information to come out of that. And so, you know, additive is still new. We're still learning in die casting how to apply it. But I, I don't think we'll ever use heating, at least for traditional aluminum magnesium kind of die casting. Uh, okay, uh, and then someone did ask uh, if you could repeat which process suits the H13 um, steel process. Okay, so, so H13, I, I, I am not a direct expert in this. This is what people are telling me. Uh, Jacob probably knows more about this than I do. But uh, my understanding is when you do powder bed fusion. So, so let me take a step back. In my opinion, powder bed fusion is the best process for uh, best conventional additive process for die casting because it's easy to do conformal cooling and that's really what we're looking for. Um, and so the problem though is that H13 has a cracking problem. Um, and so the only way to get H13 to work in powder bed fusion is you got to heat up the uh, bed, you got to heat up the chamber to really high temperatures. And people have told me as hot as 500 degrees centigrade. And so this is obviously you know quite demanding to do that. And so typically, People have moved away from H13 with powder bed fusion, and they are using currently is Mar region 300. But as I, I suggested, you know, Dido has a new steel uh, that appears to be working better for powder bed fusion. And I think we're going to hear from Bowler on a new steel that they think uh, will work better for powder bed fusion. But the NACA data showed that H13 is a primarily is a primary is a primary alloy. And so that was that was kind of a bit surprising to me. And so I don't have data, but I suspect that it's that subtractive plus additive approach that I was talking about from HTS, where they've kind of kind of got around actually doing powder bed fusion and they're machining and then using additive processes to kind of join lots of parts together. So that's my guess is what they're doing. You can also do it with the direct energy deposition. Uh, but I don't think too many people are doing just monolithic parts from uh, H13 in directed energy deposition. Yeah, I was going to mention I'd seen some uh, some some work in H13 in, in DED uh, and also some in laser powder bed. But like you say, there there are some challenges for H13 as the standard chemistry. But uh, I think that that does lead us well right into our next conversation uh, with with Daniel. Um, so I, I'll. Uh, introduce him, but uh, appreciate it, Steve. And, and if there are more questions, we'll we'll take some at the end as well. And and uh, so if you do have more questions, feel free to send them in. Um, thank you. Excellent. So thank you, Steve. Um, all right, Daniel Dybold. So um, uh, I met Daniel a few years ago. Uh, he's been working at Bowler now for I believe in in this particular area for about nine years um, in powder metallurgy and specifically now into additive manufacturing over the uh, past few years. Um, really creating new alloys and developing new alloys that are specifically designed for additive manufacturing. And, and, and that's something that Elementum has had an interest in for a long time is looking at materials that are for AM but can apply to applications like dye steels and, and others where the traditional chemistries are either more difficult to print are inconsistent, have cracking problems. So um, uh, let's dive right in and listen to uh, Daniel from Bowler. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for this really nice introduction, Jacob. Uh, we already heard a lot of very interesting presentations so far. So also thank you to Dr. Steve Mitzen uh, for his very interesting uh, input. And yeah, we have now learned uh, a lot on, on what is high pressure die casting, uh, what benefits does additive manufacturing bring in terms of pressure die casting. And uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is what kind of materials could be used for additive manufacturing uh, uh, for the 3D printing process 
And uh, therefore, I've also brought a special guest today. It's my colleague from R&D. It's uh, Milos, Milo, Miloslav Ognyanov. Uh, Milo is working for Böhler since uh, 2014. He is our main researcher and responsible for development of materials spe specifically used in hot work tooling. And, and so he will then uh, give a, a brief introduction on our newest development uh, on a, yeah, let's say an easy printable hot work tool steel. Good. I hope you can see my presentation right now. And yeah. I will directly jump into it. Uh, what is the content of the presentation? First of all, since basically I'm not sure if everyone knows uh, who we are, what we are doing, I will give an overview on the first Alpine Böhler Edelstahl group. Uh, I will talk a little bit about what additive manufacturing uh, does at first Alpine Böhler Edelstahl, and I will talk about new development. Good, and then finally we'll do a summary and conclusion. So who are we? First Alpine Böhler Edelstahl uh, already has 150 years uh, know-how and experience in the production of high-speed steels, tool steels, as well as special materials for the highest demands. Uh, we are supplying our materials worldwide. Uh, our product range uh, is well, our materials we produce is mainly, uh, is mainly bar materials. So we produce uh, bars with a very uh, small dimension, let's say from one millimeter diameter up to big mother blocks with a size of 1,200 uh, millimeter by uh, 800 millimeters. So we have a very wide range of materials and uh, um, uh, shapes we are doing. Uh, this is a brief overview on First Alpine Böhler Edelstahl. So here in Kapfenberg and based in Austria, in the middle of Austria, in the heart of Austria, uh, here we are working, we have 2,260 employees in our two sites, so in the Kapfenberg and in the Deutschendorf site. Uh, in the last fiscal year, we had a, a sales of roughly 600 million euros. Uh, we produce in one year, around about uh, 124 tons of materials. So this means uh, 124,000 tons of materials. It means uh, nickel base alloys, steel alloys. Uh, basically, we produce materials in 250 different kinds of uh, alloying uh, chemical compositions. Uh, we have here at, in the place the most advanced production. Uh, we are world leader in quality and technology. So, and for sure, our materials, so our steels are 100% recyclable. So, where do we deliver our materials? So, as mentioned, we are doing 124,000 tons. This is 99% uh, of, uh, of this quantity is bar materials, so which I have shown on my first slide. We deliver our materials all over the world to all different kinds of applications starting from aerospace industry to automotive industry. Uh, we are also very well known in the tool making industry. So that means in the high pressure die casting, plastic ejection molding industry. But we are also delivering our materials into the oil and gas industry, energy industry, engineering and machining industry. So this is basically a general overview on what we are capable to do here in Austria in Kapfenberg. I will not go into detail into this because I mean, that will just uh, be too much information and will take too much time to get all over this. Uh, but basically what I want to show you is we have a big steel plant in the background. Uh, we have uh, the possibility to remelt our materials. Uh, we have the possibility to produce materials with highest quality uh, in high quantities. We have our own forging rolling mill in the background. Uh, and what I want to concentrate today on is our powder production for additive manufacturing. So, and one of our big advantages is that we can produce our pre-material, which we use for production of additive manufacturing uh, powders, uh, we can produce it all by our own with our 
let's say, big steel mill in the background with our special steel mill in the background. Uh, so that makes this, makes it for us, let's say, possible to produce theoretically more than 250 grades. So that's a short insight in our Böhler Ampo powder production. So Ampo means additive manufacturing powder. Uh, currently, we have eight standard grades uh, available, but theoretically, we could produce uh, materials. Uh, we could produce 250 different grades, steel grades. Uh, the particle fraction we produce uh, in our powder production for IAM is in the range of 15 to 150 microns. So basically, when you talk about additive manufacturing, you're talking about the size fraction of 15 to 45 of 20 to 53 microns. So that's the typical um, powder range you use for the 3D printing process. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, as Dr. Mitzen has already introduced also the DET process. In the DET process, you use a little bit uh, the coarser fraction, so from 45 to 90 to 120 microns in that range. So with our production, we could cover all those processes. And uh, all our materials are produced via argon, uh, argon atomization, so under inert gas atmosphere, um, as well as the uh, let's say the, the seeding process and the, the classification process is also done under in inert gas atmosphere and also uh, the packaging. So what is our positioning in the added value stream when it comes to 3D printing? Uh, we have here, you can see here the full value added stream for additive manufacturing beginning with the powder production alloy development, design, 3D parts manufacturing, surface and heat treatment uh, till the final and finished 3D part. Uh, where we see ourselves in this value added stream is the powder production and the alloy development. So as mentioned, we have a big steel plant in the background uh, and therefore we have also a big R&D in our background where we have the possibility to develop new materials, to develop materials specifically dedicated for 3D printing. Uh, we have the capability, and this I will show on the next slide, uh, to produce powder for additive manufacturing. But for all of the other uh, process steps in this value-added chain, uh, we work together on the one hand side uh, with our additive manufacturing centers, in the, which, which are in the first Alpine group. So these are our competence centers, let's say. Um, and for sure, we have the uh, uh, possibility and the capability to produce much more powder than our additive manufacturing centers uh, can use. Therefore, we also work closely together with other uh, partners, with other cooperation partners like Elementum 3D. Uh, we work closely together with other customers and yeah, that's basically where are we located and where we see ourselves in this added value stream. Coming a little bit to our powder production roadmap. Uh, as I've shown in one of these previous slides, we have the capability to, produ to produce all of our material, pre-material of the feedstock we put into our uh, systems by our own. So basically, how does our powder production work? We do the melting in vacuum or under protective gas atmosphere. So that means we basically use a Vega system, which means vacuum induction and gas atomization. So we put in the electrodes, which, we, which is our feedstock, into the vacuum chamber. We melt up this feedstock, we pour it into a tan dish, and then, and then we atomize it under an air gas atmosphere. Uh, so as already mentioned, uh, we do it under vacuum and we have an argon in air gas atmosphere. Uh, but the powder which comes out here on the, on the bottom after this production is not 100% usable for AM. So therefore, we need to do another classification step, which is basically a combination of C 
receiving and air classification. Uh, this process is then done also under argon inert gas atmosphere, uh, just to protect all these powders. And you, as you know, the powder has a very big surface and to avoid oxidation, you need to do this under uh, protective gas atmosphere. And as well, the, the packaging can be done also, so the filling of the powder into the packages can be also done under protective gas atmosphere on our side. Uh, we also installed an internal lab where we can do all those typical measurements which are done on additive, in, uh, additive manufacturing powders, uh, like chemistry, chemistry, like measurement of the particle size distribution, uh, like measuring does the powder have a flow? So these are these typical flowability testings. Uh, we have the possibility also to do an apparent density measurement. And uh, for sure, we can also measure the morphology, the shape of the powders, uh, the density of the powders, and so on. So this is what we are capable of to do. And my last slide before I head over to my colleague Miloslav, who will then give you an introduction on our latest development, uh, where we see really a big potential also in high pressure die casting. I will give you a last, uh, just as some last words on our additive manufacturing powder portfolio. So basically at the moment, we have five standard products. Uh, those standard products are example giving the Böhler W722 Ampo. So what is this kind of grade? That's that grade, uh, which was Dr. Mitzen speaking about, the standard margin grade, which is typically used in additive manufacturing. Besides that, we have another grade, which is the Böhler M789 Ampo. Uh, this is a material which is very well and very good option for plastic injection molding. So this one combines the high strengths and the toughness values of the standard margin steel, the 1.2709, uh, with corrosion resistance of the 17-4 pH grade, which is our N700. Uh, besides that, we have two nickel base alloys, the typical alloy 718, as well as the alloy 625. Mm -hmm. The 718 alloy, we have in uh, two versions. We have the AMS version, which is very well known in the, let's say, aerospace industry. Uh, as well in as well as in um, for standard uh, applications where you can use the 718, and then we have the API version, uh, which is very well known in oil and gas industry. And what I also mentioned already in in one of the previous slides is the particle size ranges we can do so 15 to 45, 45 to 90, 45 to 150. So the first one is basically what is used in the typical 3D printing. Uh, and the other ones are mainly used in, in, in laser cladding, uh, direct energy deposition, uh, and, and those kind of applications. Good. And now I will head over to our latest development, to our, yeah, and this one will be done then by my colleague Miloslav Ognianov. Please, Milo, go on. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I would like to show you uh, our new development for especially for uh, application in aluminum pressure die casting um, the development criteria was on the other side uh, to create a steel based on uh, carbon martensite uh, and on the on another side to uh, to have a, a printability by preheating temperature below 200 degree. So uh, to the characteristics of, of this steel, um, we compared this steel with uh, W300 or H11 or H13. Maybe uh, just a little bit uh, additional information. In Europe, we used H11 for uh, pressure die casting aluminum. And the United States is uh, mostly H13, but uh, the differences are not really big. As you can see on, on the uh, left side, the chemical composition 
of H11, H13, Bulo W360, and this new steel. Uh, maybe uh, important elements here: uh, the carbon, uh, the carbon content. We have uh, 0.3 uh, weight percent um, carbon content is uh, lower compared to H11 and H13. This is important for the possibility. And maybe the another important uh, element is also molybden. We have a high content of molybden here with nearly three weight percent. And this is important, of course, for the mechanical uh, properties. Uh, <clears throat> the microstructure and mechanical property, uh, properties fully for the NATCA requirements. And uh, in general, uh, adjustable working hard hardness is uh, between 42 and 52 HRC. Uh, the alloy was printed with uh, different um, different machines, Trump, EOS, and SLM solution uh, for a laser pol uh, for a laser uh, polder bed fusion. The printability in laser fusion polder bed fusion is granted from uh, 180 degree. Uh, now I show you uh, some a comparison of the processability uh, between H11 and the new development. Here in this slide is W300 or H11. Uh, the contour plot shows the expected porosity depending on the process parameters. Uh, the darker blue color is mean lower porosity. Uh, the H11 uh, has no uh, shows no stable processing window. As you can see, uh, especially the uh, laser power and the scan speed um, influenced strongly uh, the porosity. Um, compared to this is our new development. You can see we have uh, wall, wall surface with uh, deep uh, blue color. It's mean very low porosity. So it's mean uh, uh, the influence of the parameters is not so big. So uh, the, the the broad processing window is actually very important for the uh, reproduce, reproducibility of the quality. And yeah. Uh, this is uh, following the lower carbon content. We have uh, a better or, the, or uh, a, a broader processing window here. The hardness tempering behavior of the new development compared here also to H11 and H13. Um, the heat treatment parameter. You can see uh, hardening and subsequently uh, uh, tempering two times. Uh, the secondary harden hardness maximum is uh, by 53 HRC. And interesting is above tempering temperature of 570 degree, the hardness of the new of the new material is higher than H11 and H13. This is um, because we have here a uh, higher molybden content. Uh, the mechanical property properties on the left side hardness, on the right side um, impact energy, Chappie V, uh, with uh, 22 joule Chappie V at 46, 45 HRC. The hardness level of, of the steel is similar to uh, H11 or H13. 
uh, eBay. eBay is mean electroslag remated uh, steel. Um, on the right side, uh, we have a tensile test for different uh, hardness condition here for uh, uh, 51, 46, and 52 HRC. Um, the, uh, the tensile strength by 45 HRC is 1500 megapascal. The um, um, EU point uh, 1300 megapascal and um, elongation uh, at fracture with nearly 13%. So now to the microstructure, uh, as you can see, uh, we have a well-tempered martensitic microstructure. Uh, the microstructure was rated uh, according to NATCA. NATCA is uh, North American Die Casting Association with HS1, acceptable. The grain size was rated according to our ASTM with 13. And important, the uh, retained, uh, retained austenite content of retained austenite is uh, below uh, 1%. And also the porosity is here 0.1%. Uh, uh, now I give back to the Daniel for the conclusion. Thank you from my side. Thank you, Miroslav, for the presentation, for presenting our newest development. So basically, to summarize, uh, the carbon content is slightly lower uh, than it is compared with an H11 or H13 process. And as uh, Dr. Steve Mitzen also told in his presentation, H13 is, uh, is basically the most used uh, material in, hash in, in pressure die casting when it comes to conventional, uh, uh, let's say, conventional uh, tool steels or to conventional inserts. Uh, when, when it comes to AM, uh, then H13 does not really work that well because of these tensions, because of the uh, stress, um, uh, because it's, it's very easily cracking. And so with our development, we think that we found a possibility to let's say reduce the risk of cracking uh, to have a good solution uh, as alternative for the H13 material. Uh, as you have seen the mechanical properties of this material uh, produced with laser powder bed fusion process fulfills the North American die casting association requirements for the H13 grade. So this means pretty good values. Uh, basically uh, it's possible to, um, to, to, to heat treat the new development to a hardness of 52 HRC. But when it comes to high pressure die casting, it's not always uh, a need to go to the highest hardness. In high pressure die casting, it's very often a compromise uh, of toughness and hardness. And therefore, um, you, you need to find a very good solution uh, to avoid stress crackings, to avoid heat shakings, uh, and so on. And therefore, you need to find a good compromise in terms of hardness and toughness. And that's the reason why we propose to use the material at, uh, let's say, certain lower hardness levels at, as it would be able to heat treat the material. But therefore, you will have a much better toughness, which is pretty good for uh, which works then pretty good in uh, uh, high aluminum high pressure die casting applications. Sorry. So what we also did is, and this is something we can we can discuss on request if someone of you is interested in this material. We did also some immersion steering tests and thermal cycle tests uh, in an aluminum two to six D alloy, uh, and we did this kind of tests to simulate the performance of the of our new development in, yeah, in, in high pressure die casting um, conditions. And those uh, tests have shown that the thermochemical resistance of our new development is roughly on the same level 
as it is the H11 or H13 grade. And also the thermal shock resistance of this new development is uh, above the H11 or H13 grade. So we see, and also above the, uh, let's say, standardly used margin steel, and therefore we really see a big potential for this material in high pressure die casting. The only thing is, I mean, we did a lot of testings. It's our new development. Uh, we we have done a lot of theoretical tests. We have done a lot of uh, tests in in the labs. But what we are now looking for is really, and since we see a high potential in the material, is looking for real field tests to approve this potential. And therefore also looking for partners who would like to test the material. And with that words, I'm at the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you also to Miloslav uh, for supporting me in the presentation. And I'm looking forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Daniel and Miroslav. Um, yeah, I think I think that that kind of brings us to to the point of the discussion today, which is, you know, this material was specifically designed and developed for um, high pressure die casting of aluminums. But the idea is that, you know, we've been stuck in the additive manufacturing world in alloys that have been prescribed for additive because that's what worked 20 years ago when they first started developing these alloys. Um, as, as Elementum, uh, that's, that's been our focus, is expanding that materials library by working with people uh, like, like Daniel and, and working with uh, organizations like the ADAPT Center that Steve Midson is running uh, and many others across the United States and across the world. So I think it's important for us to focus not on only what was available, um, because I think that does restrict us quite a bit. I mean, you know, the Meraging Steel has its place and there are advantages to that. But I think there are steels and there are materials that are designed and developed for particular applications that will overcome some of the problems that we're seeing in those. Um, as far as, you know, full adoption and moving towards, you know, full production um, using additive manufacturing, that is one of the big restrictions in the industry right now is finding materials that aren't your standard grades, that aren't H13, because that's not for additive. It wasn't designed for additive, it wasn't developed for additive, it was just what's traditionally been used. So um, that's that's always what Elementum has been about, is inspiring people to think about how do we apply materials and materials knowledge in our base of metallurgy to new applications or to applications that um, we can now begin investigating because we have these new materials. So I really appreciate it, Daniel. And, and, and certainly I think, um, Hopefully, we're able to utilize more of those uh, those other grades um, from yourself and, and from others as well. So um, I'm really excited about the future of materials for additive manufacturing. Absolutely. Um, so we we, ha we did have a question about where the H13 cracking fr comes from, and, and you touched on it in your, your uh, presentation, but uh, would you like to expand on why the carbon content seems to be an effect? Yeah, the carbon content is, um, let's say, basically connected to the transformation, to the martensitic transformation when it comes down uh, to the cooling. So let's say in the, during the printing process, you bring on the powder on the powder bed. Then with the laser, you melt the material up. And during the cooling process with the carbon content, you will have a martensitic transformation. And this martensitic transformation uh, leads to an increase of the volume of the material because you have different kind of, uh, let's say, uh, structure in the material. And that is further than leading to cracks. And if you lower a little bit the carbon content, for sure you will also have those transformation, but it's not initiating so much stresses and therefore it's not that uh, risk, uh, the risk for cracking is not that high. Excellent. Um, so I, I want to make a couple of comments here um, as as we're uh, um, getting a couple more questions in, but I, I do want to make some comments and, and I, I want to be able to get to um, the discussion about the uh, design competition where, where we will be printing some materials from, from one of the Buller steels um, and, and trying to really, again, share some information, share some uh, results 
from that with this group and with others. So um, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, and let's dive into that conversation. Okay. So uh, the steel parts design, who, who is Elementum? Why are we holding this? Why are we hosting this? Um, as Elementum, as I mentioned earlier, we're about expanding that materials library available for additive manufacturing. As part of that, we have a number of printers in-house to help produce initial components to really get into um, what are the advantages? How can we change surface finish? How can we change um, the way a material interacts with certain uh, designs and applications. And so it's really about being the material science experts at Elementum so that we can help your application and then transition that to either production at your facility um, or production at one of the one of the really great um, uh, contract manufacturers around the United States uh, or in Europe. And so um, as part of that, we're, we're really looking for more applications. We have a few and we've seen some excellent applications that, that we just, we simply can't share with anyone because they belong to um, a very specific and small area. I think there is so much advantage in being able to share even a little bit of information, even if we don't go into all of the details about a specific application, but if we can show here is where there was an innovation um, and here was the advantage of that innovation over the previous uh, uh, designs. If we can share that as a manufacturing community, I think there will be a higher growth in the additive manufacturing um, usage in the idea of why we're using additive as a whole. And so I think there is a lot of room for uh, us as manufacturers, as design engineers, to be able to open that up. But as part of it, we have to be a little bit more open as far as what and who we're sharing at least some wins about additive manufacturing because we see a lot internally and i'm sure some of you have seen advantages in additive manufacturing but when we're going to sell that idea to either a customer to um executives in our own companies uh, what we need evidence we need to be able to say look these people are succeeding with it how can we so as part of that I want to dive into this uh, steel design competition. Over the next few weeks, I'm hoping to see submissions from many of you uh, of, of one to five pages, just a write-up of here's our proposal on what we would like to do. Um, Elementum will then uh, uh, print the winning design, um, and we'll talk about then hopefully a share and exchange of results of that uh, with at least this group um, to be able to discuss, here are the advantages of a, a really interesting design in a real application over that as what's been done um, you know, with traditional manufacturing. So we're offering to print it free of charge for the winner, as long as that winner comes back and at least share some information so we can share that information with the group. Um, so as part of that, we'll be taking design proposals over the next few weeks. Um, we'll then uh, decide on a winner, and that winner will be announced at Rapid. Uh, we'll also announce and, and send out the winning information, the winner's information to this group. Um, if we have some really great submissions, um, I expect we may even look at a couple of applications and print a couple of the winning uh, designs. But, but primarily, I re would really like to see um, some designs that come in, some applications that people really think that there could be advantage in. Uh, we'll share and being able to help support that. Um, and so uh, I, I'd like this to be, you know, relatively simple, just a short write-up. Uh, and then if if we do choose your your design, uh, then we'd ask for a CAD drawing so that we can go then forward to print it. Uh, we do have some guidelines, the maximum part size. I'd like to keep it in the range of about six inches by six inches at most. Certainly a little bigger, a little smaller, we can we can accommodate. If it's a great design, then we'll go for it. Um, but but it's really about finding an application that we can share information about. So um, I hope everyone will participate. I hope we can get a lot of uh, uh, really good uh, things coming from. So if there's any questions about this uh, design competition, I'd be happy to answer them now, and certainly we'll answer them by email. Um, and we'll be sending out the the design the competition parameters and how to submit your designs um, soon. Um, so we, we got a couple of questions here. Um, I would like to kind of go through them. There's a question about um, 
what machines can process W360? Uh, if you'd like to take that, Daniel. Sorry, can you repeat once again? Which machines are available to process the W360 alloy? Range. Uh, basically, basically, we know the best printability for W360 would be on a Rhenisher machine or on a Trumpf machine. Oh, so at, at least, okay, let, let's say at least you need a machine where you are able to heat up to 500 degrees C. And, and at Alabama, we've done some printing of uh, W360 and, and EOS machines as well, but certainly the printability improves as you can increase the um, the the build processing temperature. So um, I, I completely agree, but there are, are certainly some applications that we found even in an EOS M290 um, that can apply. But, but certainly with the new alloy, um, the goal is that it could be put into any laser powder bed machine. Absolutely. That's right, Jacob. Okay, um, so before we go, if there are any other questions that we'd really like to jump into, I, I, I have gotten some other questions as well um, that have been answered during the, the discussion and during the presentations, but um, I, think, I think one of the um, biggest ones was, uh, and, and, and I'll leave that to both Steve first and then to, to Daniel, um, what do you see as, as maybe the next uh, uh, material or application that, that you feel um, will really drive additive going forward? So Steve, I'll, I'll, I'll have you answer first. Well, I mean, I, 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 um, I mean, uh, I, I, I think Corey Vian from Silantis put it really, really well, that if people can work out how to do conformal cooling in directed energy deposition, then that will take over the industry. Um, I, 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 and people are trying to do that. I, I've heard that uh, uh, DMG Mori have a patented process to be able to do that. I don't know what it is. Um, there's also guys at Michigan Tech who have kind of approached the die casting industry and kind of looking for funding for an idea they have and again i don't know what it is and, and so if we could do directed energy deposition that would bring the cost down i think and uh, allow it to do bigger inserts um and so that i, I think would be kind of a, a good thing moving forward uh in terms of the actual uh, uh um materials you know we don't use my raging steel conventionally in die casting because it's more expensive than uh, H13. And so, you know, as companies such as Bowler and other people also are kind of coming up with uh, um, new alloy compositions that can be processed by a powder bed fusion, that too is going to have an effect on the industry, I think. Great. And Daniel, the same question. So basic, uh, can sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, what what do you see uh, beyond uh, die casting? What do you see as either the the next material need or the uh, the next great application that we'll see in additive manufacturing of steels? So, Milo, do you would like to answer that? So I would say uh, steels based on carbon martensite uh, would be in the future, but uh, we wait for the, for the machines, for the right machines. Okay? And I think the producer of the 3D machines uh, for the future, because also EOAs, so you can uh, preheating to 200 degree in a normal EOAs machine, but this is only theory this is not the praxis because this 200 degree you cannot you you don't have the 200 degree constantly and homogeneously uh, uh, to the time and to the all uh, room so this is uh, the problem you need a uh, better heating models for the machines and then uh, i would say uh, definitely uh, uh, carbon martensite or bimodal hardening materials. It means a mix between 
Carbon, Carbon Martensite and Marigen Steel. For me, this is the future, would be the future. Easier to print, to printability, and uh, the same uh, properties like as uh, bulk material in, in uh, uh, Carbon Martensite. Can I, uh, Jacob, can I add something to, to that comment? Uh, we kind of discussed this at a recent NADCA meeting, and uh, you know what what we decided, and, and don't hang your hat on this, but I think this is correct, is that H13 uh, actually mar aging gives better heat checking resistance than does H13, but H13 has better solder resistance than does mar aging. So mar aging tends to dissolve and have a solder issue. I think it has lower chromium than does H13, and that might be part of the issue. While uh, uh, Mar aging actually does give better heat checking resistance, but again, we don't use it generally because it's a lot more expensive um, in, in machine blocks. And so, you know, looking forward to new steel compositions to combine those two things, you know, can we get better heat checking resistance uh, and can we get a better solder resistance from an alloy of a single composition would be a great way forward. Yeah, and I think that brings up an important point too of, of additive manufacturing. It can be an expensive process, but the turnaround time and, and the benefits that you get for the after production um, really tend to make up for that in, in many cases when you have the right business case. Um, the logistical benefits are there as well, but the materials cost generally is a relatively small portion of the total cost of the part. And, and so that's that's brought up quite a bit in a lot of different circles is, is the cost of the material being a big driver. But um, I think that's a maybe a traditional manufacturing way of thinking about it. Um, whereas additive manufacturing really can utilize um, the advantages of additive being that you can create these complex parts, the waste material is generally recollected and used to print again. Um, and so the cost of the material becomes a smaller portion. Not, it's not gone by, by, by no means, um, but it is a smaller portion of the um, calculation uh, in, in deciding what is right, what is the right application. Okay, um, with that, I, I will be sending out all of the information about the, the steel competition um, so this will be out in an email. It will also be available um, to, to be sent to your colleagues um, and anyone else that you think would be interested in, in entering. Um, so yeah, I, with, with that, I, I really appreciate everyone attending today. Um, we will be uh, looking to host more of these sorts of uh, discussions with experts in the field um, as we go about other topics. I think our next uh, might be a, about nickel super alloys and the applications of those. So if, if those of you who are here are also interested in nickel alloys, I think that may be our next um, uh, discussion. So I appreciate everyone attending, um, and I think that's all for me. Thank you to Steve. Thank you to uh, Daniel as well. Thank you also, Jacob, uh, for hosting. It was a pleasure for me. Me too. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye, everyone.